Ahead of the Oshu governorship elections, police declare war on vote buyers and deploy detectives. Meanwhile, APC mocks Funke Akindele's nomination and says PDP is on serious. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. Candidates from, the all part, from all political parties contesting in July 16 Oshun state governorship elections have signed a peace accord today. Now, this is coming barely three days to the gubernatorial elections, which we'll be holding on the weekend. Now, the convener of the National Peace Committee, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, said violence is a fundamental threat to Nigeria's democracy as he charged the aspirants and politicians to see the signing of the peace accord as a symbolic commitment to democracy. Nigeria's electoral body, INEC, has also promised to ensure a level playing field for all political parties ahead of the July 16th governorship elections in Oshun State. With barely three days to the close of campaign by political parties, the Commission's chairman, Mahmoud Yakub, said the choice of who leads the state now rests on the electorate. Joining us to discuss this is Comrade Mark Adebayo. He is a human rights activist and a former national chairman of COA. It's good to have you join us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, comrade. We're going to look at this election and the process involved from a social, um, from, from um, you know, an activist perspective. And of course, we're going to also look at it from a social, social um, civil society perspective. Um, let's talk about the government of um, Governor Yetola. Um, many civil society organizations have said they want to stand by him. Of course, there are other, who, others who are running for this office. But um, the civil society, the last time I spoke with one person here, he spoke about all the things that he has done that has laid the groundwork for um, you know, the next elections to return him. Uh, but I watched the um, debates that, uh, that held over the weekend um, uh, some days ago. And... Um, Several of the participants spoke about some issues, uh, issues um, like uh, pensioners not being paid. Um, they're saying that infrastructural development is not at the pace that it should be. But tell me, why would the average Oshu person want to vote for Governor Yitola? I am an indigenous of Oshu State, and I want to align my position with the report of the civil society organization that visited Oshu State to inspect the projects and programs of the government in the last three and a half years. And uh, I believe in that report, and I, I want to align myself with it, that the governor has performed creditably well in all areas of uh, governance indices. Now, um, you are talking about uh, complaints about pensions and salaries. Let me remind uh, all of us that uh, before this governor, governor came on board, there was something called modulated salary structure. Uh, AK, uh, uh, half salary or one third of salaries per month. And then there was no pay payment of pension whatsoever at all. Those, that one was uh, sort of suspended. But it came, it cleared the backlog of salaries. And from that time, it canceled modulated salary structures. Civil staffers in the were getting their full salaries monthly. And then it has been paying pensions. That's why the fact that Oshu State is not, is not an oil-producing state. It's not uh, one of the states that are getting jumbo uh, amounts from the federation accounts. The governor has been able to manage the little resources agreeable to the state in a manner that is, uh, you know, delivering the dividends of democracy to the people of Oshu State uh, you know, within the confines of the resources available to it. So uh, if, if you look at the area of infrastructure, the governor has done well in the area of roads. I, if you look at for, uh, the Oshobo Ikerun Ilan Rogu Road, uh, that's a stretch of uh, almost a, almost 100, 100 kilometers, you know, which has been able to uh, rehabilitate. But also for you to know that that road is a federal government road, but the state government has been able to to fix that road. So also is the Bogon Akoda 
road, all those roads that were terrible before are now are now uh, in good condition. Now, Osho in the area of health delivery, Osho State has 320 health centers across the three territorial uh, zones and all the local governments in the, in the state. Oh, if you go to any of these health centers today, judging by the report of the civil society organization that visited uh, to go and look at the projects there, they have been well rehabilitated, they have been equipped, they have been restarted, and then there is the medicine available in all those 320 health, health centers. And you will know that since 1985, during the Babangida regime, it was discovered that Nigeria needed primary health care uh, to treat malaria, to treat uh, to, to undo pregnant women, to undo uh, sick uh, children. That was supposed to be our focus. And the Babangida regime, as far back as 1985 and 1986, under Professor Nikola Kuti, decided that primary health care is more important, is more paramount to Nigerians than the tertiary one. So, so that health care can reach every nook and cranny of the country. And that, what, that is what has been replicated in, in my state of Ocean. So uh, the governor has done well, and I believe he deserves to, to be returned as governor for another term. That is my, my, my belief. I want to break down some of these things that you, because you've talked about everything. You've talked about infrastructure, you've talked about health care, but let's go to the infrastructural part. Um, when people or governments talk about the fact that, oh, we've built uh, or we've created a road, a 1,000-kilometer kilo, 1, stretch road, and so the government has done well as part of their scorecard, I wonder why we should be applauding you if we pay... Uh, vote. This, is, this is the basic that the government ought to do, and it's not that the government is doing it with money from their pockets, are they? This is taxpayers' money, so why should we be applauding Governor Yetala for fixing the roads? It's his job. But what outside of the ordinary has the governor done for the people of Oshun State? Let's take, for example, how attractive is Oshun State in terms of FDI, foreign direct investment? Um, how robust is the economy in that state? Uh, well, you know, when you're analyzing public issues like this, it is not about applauding a governor or a government for doing what it's supposed to do. It is about making comparative analysis of his records, because you are asking for scorecard. And when you are asking for scorecard, you are asking for tangibles to mention what and what he has been able to achieve in the last three uh, years, uh, three and a half years. We should now ask whether he deserves to be returned as governor. So when making a comparative analysis, you have to put what has been done, vis a -vis what has been left undone prior to his coming. And that's why we are making this comparative analysis that within the confines of the available resources to Ocean State, what the governor has been able to achieve is commendable. They are not applauding him for doing what he's supposed to do, but there are many other states and, and governors and governments that do not do what they are, they are constitutionally elected to do. So if you see one doing it, it's not about applauding. What you, are, you have asked a question, I am answering you that this is what I have observed as, a, as an indigenous of Ocean State that the governor has done, and then also considering the report of an independent arbiter, the civil society organization that went to a few states, who released a comprehensive report of their uh, analysis and observations of what has happened in the ocean state. So I am basing my own contribution and intervention simply on those ones. Let's talk about security. Um, INEC has said that all non-sensitive materials have been um, you know, sent to um, the polling units. Um, also, um, a few weeks ago, the INEC chairman also expressed worry about, you know, pockets of violence in the state. As much as he thinks that the state is calm right now, he's worried about what might erupt um, during the elections. But what's the security situation like and what plans have the government put in place to mitigate this? Well, I, I wouldn't claim to know what the government has uh, put in place because most of these things depend on the police and other security agencies. You understand? And uh, we discovered that uh, the IGP has moved uh, over about 3,000 police personnel to the place, two, uh, two DIGs, uh, about two or three AIGs and other commissioners and other uh, that are there to, to provide security for the election. You know, security has always been uh, a recurring decimal in the electoral processes of Nigeria. And I believe, as was done in the kitchen, that 
I will make a collaboration with uh, this country justice will ensure, and all the stakeholders will ensure that peaceful election on Saturday. And I should say people are peace-loving people, and I'm sure they will give peace a chance. What we can only do is to encourage all the politicians, all the stakeholders, the voters, the electorate, the, and all the people that are involved in this exercise to give peace a chance and to ensure that it is the people of Oshu State who will win on Saturday. Not PDP, not APC, not Labour, not ADC, no, not, not uh, individuals. But that the people of Oshu State will ultimately be the winner on Saturday. Okay. Well, so that's, I, I, we can only call the people and all the stakeholders to ensure that there will be peace uh, on Saturday. And I'm sure it's going to be achieved. It is achievable and it will be achieved. Let's talk about civil society's role in all of this. I mean, you have already sued for peace and all of that. Uh, what role is civil society playing and has been playing before now? Because it's one thing to say, oh, we agree with what the governor is doing. We want him to return. Um, as, as opposed to um, what you're doing, how on the ground are you in terms of sensitization, in terms of person-to-person um, -person conversations as to how... Uh, the outcome of the election should be in terms of the peacefulness, what people need to do, voters need to know. Uh, because, of course, if there is some sense of insecurity, people might, you know, feel um, they might not necessarily want to show up at the polling units to, you know, cast their votes because there, uh, there's some level of uncertainty. So what is the human, what, what are, you know, civil society people like you in Austrian state doing on the ground as we speak? Well, what, what I've recovered in the last one month, especially in the last two weeks, uh, some civil society organizations, especially from Lagos, have gone to our two states, sensitizing the people on, import, on an important issue of food buying and food selling. And educating the people that don't sell your food. Selling your food is you are selling your destiny. You are selling your glory. You are selling the future of your children. The 2,000 naira, 5,000 naira, 10,000 naira you are going to collect to food for the person that uh, gives you more than 14 for the person that is, is best positioned to give you good gov governance uh, is like marginalizing your entire generation. So people are talking about food, by speaking against uh, uh, food buying and food selling in Oshu State. Also, uh, educating the people on the reason why they must come out and for God that there is no, there's no reason and there's no wisdom in having 300,000 registered voters in the state. And on the day of the election, we only have 30,000 coming out to vote. So, civil society has been involved in sensitizing the populace about the need and the necessity and the importance of coming out to vote, to, to vote on Saturday. It's not enough for you to get your PVC and sit down in your house on the day of the election. You know, at the end of the day, whoever emerges will not be, uh, will not represent the overwhelming majority of the choice of the people of the state. If you if you have, for instance, fifteen percent of the voters coming out, I will have instances like that in this country that even less than ten percent of people will come out. Somebody will be declared winner, even if it's five percent people that, that come out. So it is the people that will lose if they refuse to come out. They are likely to get the person they don't want to have to win the election. So civil society has been there to uh, impress it upon the people the necessity, the importance, the incumbency of going out to vote and not just uh, play to don't look that let them go and do what they want to do. If you do that, what you are doing is that you are, you are, you are leaving the government destiny of your state uh, to the hands of people who are not likely to manage it well. So a popular candidate will not emerge if the uh, fortune has led to it, if the percentage of people who are going to vote is abysmally low. So civil society has been satisfying the people against vote value and against voter apathy. Mm. So that there have been sensitized people at this voter party. Go and vote and make sure that your vote counts. And that is the responsibility of, of a citizen of any state. Let's talk about the peace. And then the of security. Okay. Also, uh, civil society, even at a higher level, you can see that the peace, uh, the peace uh, this thing signed, uh, is it today or yesterday, yeah. by all the aspirants, is a way of ensuring that peace lives or start to and, and that's the question because I wanted to ask. How, how binding is that peace pact? Because I've seen several governments, every time these elections want to happen, we see these peace pacts being signed. But I always ask, how binding is this peace pact? Because 
let's take for example, I remember some years ago, I think it was 2015 or 2019 when um, the governorship elections in River State held and there was a serious peace pact that was, you know, um, signed and, and, you know, there was a handshake across the table. But then we still saw violence break out in so many places in River State. And this is detail for some other states in, in, across the country. So how binding is this peace pact? Is it just another photo op? Why, why should we even trust it in the first instance? And I'm not even trying to kick it. I'm just querying it. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, are, you have a right to interrogate, uh, to interrogate it. The issue will be that, yes, it may not be so binding because... Uh, it is not a constitutional uh, thing. Does it have I, to be? Does it have to be constitutional for us to want to embrace peace? Because uh, even some some constitutional things, we have laws everywhere, and sometimes we even break those laws knowingly and unknowingly. So, really, does it have to be constitutional? It doesn't have to be so. Nigeria, Nigeria democracy is uh, is, is still in the process of development. But if we do not give is a chance we are not our democracy is not going to last so it is important for people and the leaders of thought and uh, the political leaders religious leaders to come together to get this people to sign along the tell us if an violence breaks out at least you have something to hold them to that you you sign this why you do this just to get violence breaks out and the police now investigate and they discover that one of them was involved with the violence at least you have something to say, look, this is what you have signed, and you have gone against it, and then you are due for, to, to go to prison or to suffer some kind of legal consequences of what you have done. In any case, you know, violence is already in the law. You, you, you cannot carry arms when you are not a security uh, personnel. But when you sponsor violence, that get time allotted to you in the Constitution of so, so it is important for this peace pact to be signed, it helped us in 2015, if you remember. If you remember, I mean, it was one of the things that came from uh, President Bullock Durant and there to say, look, uh, nobody's, nobody's lives, uh, my ambition is not to want the blood of any Nigerian. So he just decided to, to let go because he remembered that, look, I agree that I, will, I, I would hand over in peace if I lose. So, and he did that. So even if it's symbolic, it is important. It's a fighter to our democratic development and processes to ensure that our elections are free, fair, and credible. Look, uh, without peace, there cannot be election, there cannot be development, there cannot be democracy. It's very, very important. Let's talk about some complaints that were put forward by INEC just quickly before I let you go. Um, Dr. Mahmoud Yakub, Professor Mahmoud Yakub, uh, spoke about the fact that um, the situation in Oshun State, like I said earlier on, was calm, but then in a recent example, he talks about the fact that the collection of permanent voters' card um, was disrupted in Erioke and Eri Jesha wards of Oriade local government area, resulting to a loss of 45 PBCs. That's the problem right there. 45 people, or apparently 46 people, have been, um, you know, uh, rid of their, uh, yes, their chances to vote. Again, he's saying that the mass is being investigated, but this, this is also an example of what I mean. It might not necessarily be violence in its entirety, but then a form of disenfranchisement. Many have also said that because certain people in a certain area support a certain candidate, they're accusing certain elements that work for the ruling party for this, this disruptions and, of course, a deliberate act to make sure that they do not get to vote the candidates of their choice. Can you help us debunk this? No, no, I won't debunk what I don't have the facts about. What is important is that whoever was involved in that, the security agencies must do their job, find out who did that, get them arrested, get them prosecuted, uh, prosecuted and let them go and serve their time. Yeah. And uh, what the constitution has uh, uh, recommended for that. You know, uh, you see, in, in Nigeria, we must find a means to ensure that we divorce violence from our electoral processes and elections. And that it will rub off badly and negatively on our elections. So, whoever did that, uh, the, the police must do their job, investigate and get them arrested and prosecuted and sent to jail. That is my own position about that. You know, whether it's the ruling party or it's not the ruling party, whatever, those are allegations. Whoever did that, whoever was involved, must be arrested, prosecuted, and let them let the court 
you know, give uh, the right to judgment about that. That is my position about that. We cannot have uh, thugs running amok. We cannot have miscreants determining the process of our elections. No, no, no. It's unacceptable. As a human rights activist, as a society person, I condemn it. It is reprehensible. It is condemnable. It is unacceptable. All right. Finally, before I let you go, what is your message uh, to the people of Oshuan again? Um, what should we be looking forward to uh, on the weekend? Well, I, my message first is that uh, everybody must give peace a chance. Give peace a chance. All stakeholders must abide by the uh, peace pact that have been signed. And the people must go out and vote. We must, we must not give uh, opportunity for photo party. Go out and vote. And if I were uh, in a full state on Saturday, I will vote to return the current governor, Utola. And I, I, I'm just, I want to call them to vote for the government to continue his good work. That's what that's my message for the people of Washington State. All right. Well, uh, Mark Adebayo is a human rights activist and a former national chairman of COA. Thank you so much, comrade, for speaking with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, get back. Uh, when we get back, uh, we will be discussing the PDP's choice of a deputy governor. And, of course, uh, we'll be talking about the APC's response to that. Stay with us.